This is Revelation chapter 6, part 4. So we have covered off the first four seals, and I won't repeat any more of that here. We now move to the fifth seal, and there we see the souls of them under the altar. What does this relate to? That we have now reached another important epoch in the career of the Roman Empire is clear from the following quote taken from Roman-Emperors.org. It says this, The Emperor Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletianus, AD 284-305, put an end to the disastrous phase of Roman history known as the Military Anarchy or the Imperial Crisis, 235-284. Diocletian attempted to use the state religion as a unifying element. Encouraged by the Caesar Galerius, Diocletian in 303 issued a series of four increasingly harsh decrees designed to compel Christians to take part in the imperial cult, the traditional means by which allegiance was pledged to the empire. This began the so-called Great Persecution. Note firstly the reference to the military anarchy and disastrous phase which was covered under the previous seals. Then note also the appearance of the religious aspect that comes into play during Diocletian's reign. The prophetic camera now swings, as it were, from the Roman Empire itself to the Christians within the Empire, and so the altar is now brought before us in the fifth seal, and underneath, underneath this we see the blood of the martyrs. The pagan religion is being pitted directly against Christianity. As a point of interest, Diocletian reorganized the empire into a tetrarchy. A tetrarchy was the term adopted to describe the system of government of the ancient Roman Empire instituted by Diocletian in 293, marking the end of the crisis of the 3rd century and the recovery of the empire. The government of the empire was divided between the two senior emperors called the Augusti and then two juniors and designated successors. On the right hand side of this slide you will see a picture of a statue. This statue represents four figures and dates from 300 AD and this shows the Tetrarchy in Rome where power was divided among four rulers. The four rulers are shown all with similar features and embracing each other as if to say they are one. Now when we reach the fifth seal the scene before us dramatically changes. It goes from the Roman Empire to the temple, to the altar. And in the New Testament, of course, this is taking us to the church, the body of Christ, which is the temple of God and Jesus Christ, our great sacrifice. Until this point, the seals have only been dealing with what's been happening to the Roman Empire itself. But what of God's people, the Christians? What's been happening to them? How are they faring? Where do they fit into all of this? Well, as we know, Rome had been going from one disaster to another. They had never liked Christians anyway. They had always persecuted them. But now their attention is fully fixed on these people. They are the ones responsible for incurring the wrath of the Roman gods against the empire. And they need to be taken out of the way once and for all. And so begins the last and greatest persecution against the Christians, and this is the subject of the fifth seal. Revelation 6, verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. The futurists speak boldly and declare that the church has been raptured out of here back in chapter 4, and so the church doesn't have to endure great tribulation, all the problems coming upon the world. They base this assumption on the fact that the word church doesn't appear again until Revelation chapter 22. Well, let's look at what the Bible actually has to say. We are definitely dealing with a Christian setting here. The altar is the place of sacrifice, and in the Old Testament it was in the tabernacle, and then later it was in the temple. But in this New Testament setting, the altar is, of course, directing us to that one offering that has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And this is our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. The verse is telling us of the souls of them that were slain for the word of God 
And this is not only a reference to Christians who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, but more specifically, it is telling us of Christian martyrs. This odour of sacrifice and the souls of them under it is telling us of Christian sacrifice for Jesus Christ. It is to be regretted that much of Christian teaching today tells us nothing of the blood of the Christian martyrs down through the ages, but instead focuses on a future period of seven years of great tribulation in which the people in the church have been told that they, have, that they will have been raptured out of here, so they're not going to have to face in any case. In relation to this, the modern church teaching is totally wrong. Persecution has been part and parcel of the church for the last 2,000 years, and as it says in Acts 14 verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. The word much used there is mega, meaning great. What more do I need to say? Teaching Christians that God will not allow them to go through great tribulation is totally contrary to the word of God, and we must be aware of this. What is being said here is reflected in the story of Cain and Abel mentioned in Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 10. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. This is the same thing that we have here. The blood of the Christians who have been butchered and murdered under pagan Rome is crying out, How long, O Lord, will it be until judgment prevails and you avenge our deaths? Now, in looking at this, we are not to presuppose that these Christians have died and gone to heaven and are there pleading for judgment and, ven and vengeance. That would be to read into the scriptures something that is not there. Note again the parallel story of Cain and Abel. In Hebrews 11 verse 4 it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel was dead, but yet he was speaking. Abel was dead, but yet his blood cried out. Yet he had a testimony that he was righteous. This is what we have here with these Christian martyrs. They were dead, and they are awaiting the resurrection, as we all do when we die, but their spilt blood was crying out to God for action. They cried out, How long? And this indicates that persecution had been going on for some time. And while this is correct, it is also true that persecution under the Roman Empire had been intermittent. However, the appearance of this seal at this time suggests something which was much more noteworthy or egregious than what had gone before. There are ten recorded periods of persecutions that Christians suffered under pagan Rome. Now we have come to the tenth and most severe of them all, as we're going to see. There had been ten imperial Roman persecutions of the church, starting from Nero. The tenth and last of these came with Diocletian and commenced in 303 AD and lasted for ten years. And this is the period that corresponds to the church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, where it says, You will have tribulation ten days. This last and greatest of all the persecutions was the most widespread and intense of all, and was aimed at the total eradication of Christianity from the empire, as we're going to see. In this article from the Britannica, we read Diocletian, Latin in full Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletianus, original name Diocles. Uh, he was the Roman emperor, 284 to 305 AD, who restored efficient government to the empire after the near anarchy of the 3rd century. Albeit with Diocletian came this most terrible persecution of the Church of God. Initially, when Diocletian became emperor, he was not concerned about Christianity, but this was to change dramatically. We read from Edward Gibbon, the resentment all the fears of Diocletian at length transported him beyond the bounds of moderation which he had hitherto preserved, and he declared in a series of cruel edicts his intention of abolishing the Christian name. Diocletian was not to be content with merely persecuting Christians here and there, 
or being sporadic with his approach, but rather he set his mind and the resources available to him for the purpose of the total eradication of Christianity from the empire. Edward Gibbon continues, by the first of these edicts, the governors of the provinces were directed to apprehend all persons of the ecclesiastical order. By a second edict, the magistrates were commanded to employ every method of severity which might reclaim them from their odious superstition and oblige them to return to the established worship of the gods, which of course would have, would have included worshipping the emperor. This rigorous order was extended by a subsequent edict to the whole body of Christians who were exposed to a violent and general persecution. Edward Gibbon also says, During the space of ten years which elapsed between the first edicts of Diocletian and the final peace of the church, it's interesting that Gibbon specifically mentions this ten-year period because it relates directly to the church age signified by the church in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, where it says, You shall have tribulation ten days, which in Bible prophecy is to be understood as ten years, as I have previously mentioned. Edward Gibbon also says, The edict against Christians was designed for a general law of the whole empire, and this became known as the Age of the Martyrs where we see the souls of them under the altar crying out for judgment and for vengeance. Here we have an article from a homeschooling resource called allinoneheighschool.com and if you have children and you're not aware of homeschooling you should check it out because the pros far outweigh the cons. This article is dealing with Roman religion and Christianity and has the heading here the great persecution AD 303 and we read this Christianity generally grew and established some roots across the empire in the years following the persecution by Marcus Aurelius so we need to understand that there had always been some persecution against Christians even during the period of the five good emperors it only became much worse at the time of Diocletian the article goes on uh, following the time of persecution by Marcus Aurelius and especially prospered from about AD 260 onwards, enjoying widespread toleration by the Roman authorities. But with the reign of Diocletian, things would change. Toward the end of his long reign, Diocletian became ever more concerned about the high positions held by many Christians in Roman society and particularly the army. On a visit to the Oracle of Apollo at Didyma near Miletus, he was advised by the pagan oracle to halt the rise of the Christians. And so on 23rd of February, AD 303, on the Roman day of the gods of boundaries, the Terminalia, Diocletian enacted what was to become perhaps the greatest persecution of Christians under Roman rule. Diocletian and, perhaps all the more viciously, his Caesar, Galerius, launched a serious purge against the sect by which they saw as becoming far too powerful and hence too dangerous. In the Britannica we read the following article in connection with Diocletian and his domestic reforms under the heading of Persecutions of Christians we read this The end of the reign was darkened by the last major persecution of the Christians. At any rate some or all of these factors led Diocletian to publish the four edicts of 303 to 304 promising all the while that he would not spill blood. His vow went unheeded, however, and the persecution spread through the empire with an extreme violence that did not succeed in annihilating Christianity, but caused the faith of the martyrs to blaze forth instead. Wonderful! Note, note this. The record is that this caused the faith of the martyrs to blaze forth. And the description of this period fits in perfectly with what we have in the vision in Revelation 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And this was the faith of the martyrs blazing forth. Praise the Lord for this. From the Horae Apocalyptica we read this. Christian blood was shed throughout the extent of the Roman world, and, long before the nine or ten years of the persecution passed, such had been its effect at the three other emperors, Diocletian, 
Maximian and Galerius united to raise pillars commemorative of their success, on which pillars inscriptions not long since and perhaps still extant recorded their vain boast of having extirpated Christianity. For church services, the Christians now met in caves and catacombs. Their only way of visibly and publicly witnessing for Christ was by martyrdom. And we struggle sometimes witnessing, don't we? And we really got to appreciate how good that we have it. Let's work while it is yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. Now, I want to come back to verse 10 again and look at the question that was asked and the answer that was provided. What we will see is that the answer that was provided was not perhaps what was expected. Let's place ourselves in the shoes of these saints that were suffering so terribly. And then ask the question and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? What would we have been looking for? We would have been looking for relief, soon, in the immediate future. But that is not the answer that was given. And we need, we, all of us need to take this to heart. If we ask a question of the Lord, will we also have the ear to hear God's reply even if it's not what we want to hear, or will we only accept an answer that is positive and tells us what we were expecting to hear? Let's examine ourselves and let's look further at this now. And here's the answer in verse 11. And white roads were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Firstly, we note that white robes were given unto every one of them, and this may signify the act of laying down their lives as speaking of their testimony of righteousness, which was afterward heard by so many, like Abel, who being dead, did yet speak. Or it may signify their ultimate reward, which is to come when Jesus returns, and there is the resurrection of the dead and the judgment. Next, we're told that they should rest a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed. This is the unexpected answer to their question. There are two groups of people being identified here. The first group are all those who have suffered under pagan Rome, which culminated in the most fierce campaign against them started by Diocletian. And this is the group asking the question, as it were, and then we see another group of people, their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed. Who are these others that were also to die? As we continue through the book of Revelation and history, this other group are all the martyrs that were to, that were to die under papal Rome. Pagan Rome killed her millions. Unfortunately, papal Rome killed her tens of millions. And I'm going to be talking a lot more about this later. Well, the answer to the question wasn't necessarily good news, was it? The Lord said unto them, I'm not coming. I'm not going to avenge you just yet. There are others who are to come who will also be slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they will hold. And as we will see later, this involved a lot more martyrdom over an even greater period of time. So the next time you're discouraged, depressed, or in despair, remember these our brethren who have suffered so greatly down through the ages. The next time you get an answer to prayer that's not as pleasant as you were expecting, remember the prayer of these earlier saints. We haven't got it so bad at this present time, have we? No, not at all. And if things do deteriorate in the future, Let's not forget that God will give us the grace that we need to meet every situation as a good soldier in the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have come down to 313 AD, which marks the end of the period of the fifth seal and ten years of great tribulation. The worse it had been, the age of the martyrs. What happens next is unexpected.
This is the end of Revelation chapter 6, part 4.